Hello, my name is John Reynolds. On this episode of Extraordinary Life Stories, I'm talking with broadcaster and TV presenter, Natalie Pinkham. Natalie has presented numerous sports on TV and been the face of Poker Channel, and most recently, literally owning the role of pit lane reporter with Sky Sports F1 since 2012. And she's getting ready for another season kicking off shortly. I want to know how she juggles family time with a busy job that takes her around the world. Natalie organises Flaxstock, a festival which the stars attend en masse to celebrate the life of her friend, Caroline Flack, who tragically took her own life. I'm really looking forward to talking with Natalie. Natalie, thank you for joining me. What a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to it. Tell me, Likewise. who is Natalie Pinker? Oh, crikey. Well... I am first and foremost a mother, yep. I would say. Um, that's the most important role in my life. Um, a wife, uh, a fundraiser, campaigner, um, broadcaster. Yeah. Bit of everything thrown in. Yeah. And I like it that way. I mean, it's hectic. Our life is crazy, sleep deprived. But <laughs> the You're energy. Still smiling, though. Yeah. And I think the energy of all of that sort of drives us as a family. Yeah. We're all a bit like that. We're always sort of juggling and but I get a buzz off that. Yeah. I think it's the way we've always been actually. Me as a person, part of my family, uh, my parents, very similar. And I've kind of met a kindred spirit in my husband that wants to take that baton and run with it as well. Yeah. I love that. We're gonna come back to that. Okay. Going back to a young Natalie growing up. Yeah. What did you want to be? So I was always fascinated with the box in the corner of the room being the television. Sure. And I didn't know whether I wanted to be a producer or a presenter, but my mum says that everything was a performance. So, you know, even buttering bread in the morning, I was like, and here is a piece of bread, and let me show you how to butter it, and here's my helpful assistant, and my mum would be like, get on with it. I love it. Get to school, for God's So I assume sake. you excelled in drama. I loved all of that. Um, I've always loved sport, yeah. uh, massively into every single sport, watching and participating. So sports programming was something that I was always from the mm. age of four like obsessed with and my earliest sporting memory was watching the 1984 Olympics cool. when Decca Slaney and Zola Bud clashed yeah. and fell and you know Zola was my hero we've actually just got a cat we're picking the cat up on Monday called Zola no way After goes right Zola back to that and Gianfranco my two sporting heroes yeah, yeah. anyway I remember watching that and I remember saying to my dad, what, what just happened? And he was like, look, this is your first life lesson. Some things aren't fair. You've got to fight harder for whatever you want in life. That's cool. And, um, and I remember seeing Zola Bud get back up and run famously without shoes on. Yeah. And I remember just being so inspired in that moment. And I remember thinking, I want to work in sports television, whether it's live sport, whether it's sport documentaries. Yeah. I was always just fascinated in it. That's Either producing or presenting and it's ended up being... You can feel the passion coming off uh, you for that. And actually, it's interesting because sport transcends so much emotion. Oh, I, yeah. I love sport. You know, I, I was in the rugby team and all the different things you can do at school and then participated in sports since. But there's, when you watch sport, especially from a live point of view, you're there or on the TV, it's amazing how powerful the emotions are and the oh, life yeah. lessons you can get from Absolutely. It. I mean, I really believe in sport as a vehicle for social change. That mm. is something I'm really passionate about, is using sport, this this thing that brings us together for me it's sport and music are the two key things that transcend everything yeah and um, obviously there's the sort of dividing lines through sport there's tribalism when you support different yeah. teams but there's underpinning that is a passion and a love for what you're actually out there on the pitch achieving yeah. or the racetrack Wh whatever it is whatever sport it is um I think it's something in humanity it taps into something deep yeah. in all of us it does Connects but if us. We can, yeah 100 percent and I think if you can use that for the greater good, then you're harnessing something very special and affecting positive change. Yeah, I like that. So back to Natalie growing up, so you're passionate about sport and you want to be in TV. How did you mesh the two together? Well, I think it was a bit of a process and like all our lives are working processes. Mm. Like we're all works in progress, but um, I picked up bits of work whenever I could get them out of uni. I actually read politics at university so um, I was really, I've always been interested in politics. Actually, my dad's always wanted me to go into politics. Okay. I was going to ask um, why do that when you were so interested in sport and so on, because that education curriculum I want to talk about. Yeah. So why did you, you politics was influenced by your dad, not so much by yeah, you? Yeah, but I think probably as a family, we've always, you know, we're big debaters. We always okay. talk about the bigger issues in the yeah. world. And 
but our passion and our shared love is sport and music. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so I don't know really. I've I've always just had an interest in it, and I thought yeah. it was quite a good degree to do. And yeah. I went to Nottingham Uni, and I loved it. Yeah. Um, and I think Dad's always been a bit disappointed that I haven't used it more with my yeah. career. But I I think actually I don't think any any university degree is ever wasted, and I think there are elements of it that you can draw upon throughout your life, no matter what you're doing. And yeah. Um, with it's, managing people, it could still come as well. Yeah. Some of what we'll talk about later. There's right. there's, there's some politics involved, and you, I know oh, you were at number yeah. ten not that long ago, and yeah. the whole thing develops into something. The it, knowledge you learn, yeah, you don't know. I, I totally agree, and also career changes can happen whenever. I yeah. mean, my mum didn't qualify as a lawyer till she was forty. So right, she's a barrister now. I won't yeah. tell you her age; she'll kill me. But <laughs> she's still going strong. Fair play. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I did politics at Nottingham and then I came and worked my way up, runner, researcher. Yeah. I made c- terrible cups of tea and it was... <laughs> deliberately. Deliberately. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm really rubbish at hoovering. Well, don't hoover anymore. Okay. Terrible at tea. Oh, let, make her run the scripts from studio to studio instead. And I would just love the studio environment. Yeah, the buzz. Oh, what a buzz. And I felt very um, intrigued by the processes of television. Yes. To, you know, in that final outcome. So I would watch things on TV and then I would wait to the credits and I'd write down who had directed or produced it. And then I would write to them or call them. That's cool. And that's quite good for being a salesperson as well. Well, it's really entrepreneurial. Yeah. Because you're creating your own opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And so out of that, did that create the break? Yeah, yeah. So then I would say, look, I'll come and I'll come and shadow, work for you for nothing, whatever it was. And uh, I ended up at Endable as a researcher on Ready, Steady, Cook out of uni. Um, Still can't cook. Working on that, though. Um, and then I just got opportunities, you know, at Sky Sports. And I was obsessed with Sky Sports from such a young age. I remember watching it thinking, what a cool place that would be to work. And then I loved Formula One with my brother. He and I would watch it and yeah. discuss it and go to Silverstone together. And then actually it was Five Live that came in and offered me a job working as a pit lane reporter for Five Live. And I thought, what a great way to sort of learn about um, the workings of Formula One. A bit under the radar. You know, it's not live TV. It's not the pressure of live TV. So I did that. But actually my first love was and always has been television. Sure. So when I got the opportunity to go back to Sky Sports, um, I jumped at it. So actually listening to you, You've married the, the perfect blend of career and interest. You could say you're doing your dream job. Well, I think, yeah, you're probably right. And you're bloody good at it. Oh. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear the passion's there. And actually, you know, you can see that from being a punter watching the TV, but you can feel it when you're having a conversation with you. And, and why Formula One? What is it about Formula One? that? Because I'm, I'm a fan as well. Right? Yeah. What is it about Formula One that's so great? I think it has it all as a sport. You know, it's, it's theatre, it's yeah. drama, it's jeopardy. There's so many subplots. Yeah. You know, anyone that says this is just a, a, a driver in a car, you know, lapping yeah. in the circles, is, it, it's just not true. There's a huge team element to it. Yeah. Um, there's so much pressure on every single team member to perform. And that you always feel that there's more to know and there's more to learn. Yeah. You know, I've been in the sport for 13 years now and I still feel as if, um, you know, it's the tip of the iceberg. There's so, you know, yeah. I'm always reading more and learning more and talking to people. And, yeah. and you know, you speak to someone like Adrian Newey and he, even he, the great Adrian, the biggest brain in Formula <laughs> yeah. One, still says that he's learning about the sport. And you That's can true. see it, by the way, even in testing. I watched him yesterday, just rubbing his chin, looking at the car, <laughs> you know, just working out where progress could be made. Yeah. And I love that about F1. It's a, it's a whole Never growth mindset. Still. Yeah, I tell you, innov- innovation, right? Absolutely. And actually just saying, like you said, about behind the scenes and so on, you in your role get to see all that. As a as a punter, again, maybe going to a race or just watching it, you never had that until Drive to Survive. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Because I think, you know, there's, there's an element of the sports become a show. There's an element of the fact that my wife now watches it. She it's watches Drive to Survive. Yes. Brilliant. And look what it's done for yeah. the global popularity. So it's achieved that goal of people that perhaps never would have watched or, or known about Formula One. Yeah. But do you have you sensed any, particularly the people that you spend a lot of time with in the pit lane, has that sporting element been reduced as a no. result? No, right. no, no, okay. no, definitely not. For me, um, Formula One used to be guilty of not feeling accessible, particularly to young women. And, you know, 
there was a time when the only women that you would see in the sport would be the grid girls. Yes. And they wouldn't be talking, they wouldn't they'd be standing there being judged purely on their looks. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with a bit of glamour in the sport. That's yeah, great. Sure. And these girls are fantastic. But I wanted them to to do more because I used to talk to them, you know, yeah. the only other I mean yeah. great bit to of have camaraderie. Them. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't like the fact that their role was so limited just to holding a placard. Yeah. Um, Drive to Survive has opened up. It's told people that they're welcome. Yes. This isn't the preserve of the right, the white rich man. It's 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 for everyone. Yes. And obviously, that's happened simultaneously with Lewis Hamilton's mission to really open up the sport, which has been incredible. And sure. I think we'll only look back um, in time and realise just how seismic mm. his um, efforts and um, contribution to the sport has been both on and off the track yeah so that's amazing but drive to survive i mean it's just been this yeah it's a sort of perfect coming together hasn't it that sort of the stars are aligned in terms yeah. of really opening up sport and showing the world what a brilliant sort of spectacle it is yeah. but also all these layers that we just talked about and the innovation and the technology and the drama and the jeopardy uh, and it all sort of culminates in a race i think what they've been so brilliant at drive to survive is drawing you in to feel invested in every driver. Totally. And the, the drivers... Giving a story. Yeah, because you, you understand mm. that these are human beings. We're all just human beings and the levels of sacrifice are huge. Yeah. Commitment, determination, um, application, everything, like great life lessons for kids around the world watching, yes. great role models. I mean, Lewis Hamilton is one of the greatest role models of our time. And you know, for me, Sorry, the moment that spoke volumes about him as a person... Abu Dhabi 2021, when his dad, and I never know, I never want to know what Anthony whispered in his ear because that was a very private moment between yeah. father and son. But whatever happened in that moment helped Lewis turn, look Max in the eye and shake his hand yeah. and accept so right. defeat in that golden. moment. Yeah. And I absolutely believe that he left Abu Dhabi with more fans globally than even if he'd taken an eighth world title. So right. Yeah. Because what a role, what a moment to show kids yeah. how to cope yeah. in that pressure cooker. I mean, especially when everyone me, was sitting at home angry. I, I, I don't were, get that animated. I was watching it. I, we were all, that's it. It we was were like, like, what just happened? What just happened? But and Lewis had, to, Lewis had the Max, heart still the way, racing. No, I get Because that. Max had driven in a sublime manner throughout the year. Yeah. Like they both deserved it. Yeah. But when it comes down to that race, yeah. And that moment, I mean, I don't want to open a can of worms. No, I, I don't want to say it again. Because it's like, yeah. it's, and, and it's, it's a trigger for a lot of people, but actually, yeah. all of those people who are triggered by that, talking about that, including look, us right now, yeah, should look to Lewis. Yeah. Look at what he's done. Yeah, you've explained that really well. He's That's unbelievable. And, and Drive to Survive also, and I've said this before, deified and humanized the drivers. So I remember walking through an airport with Sebastian Vettel. And he had his hood up and a backpack on and he looked like a student. Yeah. Nobody really turned their heads to yeah. look at him. Now, if you're walking through the airport with the England rugby team, you automatically are drawn to look at them because the physical presence. Yeah. You go, big, big oh, lads. he's a big old unit. Oh, you know, it's Courtney Laws, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're then, you know, but with, because they can kind of, yeah. don't, you, you don't necessarily look at them. And so I, I remember thinking, he's a multiple world champion and people yeah. aren't even noticing him. So what I think Drive to Survive was really, really good at was making you understand them as human beings, mm. but also when the, the visor comes down, they go to this other level of superhuman. Yeah. And they do something that we can only dream of. Yeah. They become a superhero. And what powerful television. I love that. It's so true. And I think that the other thing as well is the, the, the way that ultimately Lewis took that from a humble point of view and a failure point of view and was just over it and embracing it. There's so much made of success. It's all about being number one, beating your teammate, you know, keeping your seat, whatever it might be, you've got to succeed. But you can't succeed without failing and how you deal with it and how you learn from it. Absolutely. I'd love to know your own journey with that. You know, you've got, you've, you've achieved a lot of success. You know, you've got the dream job. How many people can say that? And you look happy. And you mentioned, as soon as I asked you who you are, the importance of family and, you know, life and so on. But what's been your relationship with failure and how you've dealt with it? Well, it's interesting because 
I feel a bit of a fraud when you say that because yeah, you. Oh, uh, because you're too humble. No, like, no, no. Having your own dream job. No, is, but is honestly, a I, I, it's, it's a really stri- like I feel uncomfortable. I, I you saying that, I really. I didn't do. mean to make you feel, but I oh, no, but, I know. I can say it. I'm no, allowed to say I, it. I, I don't. I don't feel like I am there yet. I really feel like I'm always learning, and I've always got more to do. Well, let me flip it another way. To get to where you got to, you will have gone through all sorts of hoops and things that didn't work out mm. to get there. So actually. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was an easy gift. It wasn't like yeah. you were able to get your Formula One and TV work because it was in the family or because you made it easy. So that's possibly another Maybe. way of reframing I think, it. I think I was taught from a very early age by both parents that there's no substitute for hard work. Yeah. Like you just got to get your head down and work yeah. hard. And, you know, it's all part of your journey, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's quite fun to sort of look back on it, but... Um, I suppose sometimes you have got to stop and take stock. I say that to my husband a lot. He's very ambitious, very determined, very tenacious. But he'll do something which I think is brilliant and I'll praise him for it. And he gets awkward with even his wife saying that to him. Okay, that was bloody brilliant. Well done. And he'll go, okay, okay, okay. Can we not? Right, what's next? And sometimes I say to him, look, sometimes we just have to stop as a whole family. Be present. Yeah. Okay, but we do feel grateful. But we you're good for him for in that other. element. Yeah, because yeah. Because actually, and I, I totally get that kind of relationship with my wife where actually, you know, something that she shrugs off, I'm like, you've just done really well. And she'll say, and I'm, I'm yeah. not good at it. So I, I empathise with that. And I think it's it's being present and having the right people around you that support yeah. you. And, and understanding what you have achieved or what you've done, which, you know, is also you know, relevant to you. And actually, in context of success, and you've been around so many successful people in the Formula One paddock and so on, how do you define success? Ooh, I think it's a very, very personal thing because mm-hmm. success can be getting out of bed in the morning when you're struggling, yep. you know, yep. and you're not feeling it. So actually yep. in that moment, going to work, just walking out the front door is a huge achievement. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there's when you look at the world of Formula One, I think it's the culture that we've just touched upon is that no one ever sits still. Yeah. So even when they're notching up world championships and they are achieving these great goals, they don't ever sort of take it all in and, yeah. and relax and enjoy it and, and, and wallow in it. They just, it's on to the next. Next thing. Look, life is busy. Life is nonstop and it's a short life. Yeah. And you want to pack as much in as possible. And that, genuinely, that's how I feel every day. But I think... I need to probably take my own advice sometimes and just stop and take stock of the moment. Yeah. And if something, if I am struggling with something, and I'm training for the marathon at the moment, and I and I feel like this is like a, a kind of microcosm of life as a whole. Yeah. Some mornings I just wake up and I just do not feel like going for a run. I mean, look, it's yeah, pouring, pouring with rain, rain right, right now, now. Yeah. and the thought of going out and that you're like. Yeah. So success in that moment is actually just pulling your trainers on and getting out. The and door. I bet that's you because I can tell you're really competitive and there's a drive. And it's like oh, it's not going to stop me. Yeah. Is that, is that, and yeah. do you have do you have like a morning routine? You're in the world of Formula One. There's ice baths and yeah. so and there's so many things we can do to to keep well and and keep fit mentally and physically. What works for you? I think that the marathon has the the training for it at least because I haven't done it yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> has been really good for well, me in journey, terms of right? yeah. yeah but it's been really good for me in terms of um coming back to my body and mind mm. and learning more about food I'm eating the sleep I'm getting training I'm doing yeah. but also my mental health and clearing my yeah. mind and being present and it's made me think a lot more about my kids and their diet and their you know exercise. You're, you're a better mum as a result right I think so and I think really imposing that structure on your life is really important and Formula One does do that for you because there are structures and we thrive within structures, yeah. I believe. Discipline is really healthy. Yeah. As long as it, the, the pressure of it doesn't bring on anxiety, yeah. I think you can really blossom within a disciplined structure in life. Yeah, what's the expression? No pressure, no diamonds, which is extreme, but it is like, you know, actually we, we need a certain diamonds. amount of resilience and so on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're funny. Um, and in context of that almost struggle and, and, and things that don't go right. You were great friends with Caroline Flack. Living through that whole process in terms of your own mental health and the 
the exposure to the bigger picture of what that really meant. How was that for you? Um, well, it's not a thing that was, it is. I get it's, that, you live on, it every day. It's ongoing yeah. um, and it changes, it yeah. takes different forms. Um, I think I'm a doer and I needed to do something about the way I felt and I need, I looked at her mum and I needed to do something about the way her mum felt, even though, you know, some might say, well, it's not your responsibility to do that, but I, I don't know, that's just, I, that's how I feel, is yeah. that um, words are one thing, but actions another. And I, so, so we created, with, together with some friends, yeah. a, a music festival in her honour, and that in turn, I realised that to create a really positive legacy for Caroline, um, it has to be a forward-thinking thing, not just looking back on her life and missing her, right, you know, which we yeah. do anyway, of course we do. But now it has to be very positive drive. It's towards. a celebration of her life, ultimately. It, right? it is, and we always have to harness that, and we always remind ourselves, what would Caroline do? And we always ask her mum at every juncture, are you comfortable with that? Is that right for you and the family? But ultimately, what we want to do is, and we've got very um, big ambitions to mm. improve the mental health of the nation and even the world, you know, just Brilliant. to be present and be, you know, obviously you carry a lot of guilt and well, a lot of different emotions, anger, mm. guilt, a um, lot of questions when someone commits mm. suicide. And um, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's a really weird, horrible feeling, but what we're hoping with this music and it goes back to music being I was thinking an incredible that. Transcending, yeah. Vehicle. Almost like she's there dancing with you, right? That's um, how I feel when you're yeah. talking about it. It's like, what, how would, where would she be? She'd be right there. And then you're smiling. And yeah. there's, there's the celebration. Yeah. And it transcends the emotion that you're trying to have been bringing amazing people together yeah. that all want to ultimately contribute and celebrate. Like a legacy. Definitely. But, but as you say, then to make changes in the future. Yeah, because, uh, you know, one, there's one thing, having a great party in a field once a year. Yeah. But we have then got to have this connective thread throughout the year so that you don't come to the festival and you go and you talk about the way you feel. Like, we don't want to force people out of their comfort zones to be vulnerable and say, actually, you know what? I am struggling. Yeah. We have to give them or offer them or suggest to them a pathway to recovery as well. Yeah. So that's what we're working on in her memory as a legacy for her. Yeah. Brilliant. It's awesome what you're doing. I think um, in context of mental health, it's, it's, you've just said it, you know, people have talked about it for so long. You took action. It feels like at key times in your life, you've taken action, which is also like a, a kind of coping mechanism stroke. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to be the victim mindset. That's really good. You know point. what I mean? You, could, you, know, you, you mentioned that whole, don't want to go for a run. But the extreme, of course, is in that context of the aftermath of something that, that tragic as that. Yeah. Don't want to get out of bed in the morning and actually... I've got, I've got to not only get out of bed, I've got to make an impact. I've got to make a change, a social impact that affects other people. Yeah. So, yeah, fair Do you play. Know, it's, it's, no, it's interesting because, yeah, and I haven't really ever considered that, but it's a really, really good point. And I think I probably learned it from both parents, but mostly from my mum. Yeah. My mum had a really difficult time and she had cancer and she wasn't given long to live and then she survived it. And then she said it just changed everything for her because suddenly she was given this gift of a second chance at life. And so everything is everything is yes for my mum. She says yes to everything, which is why she did a law degree at 40. Yeah. Because she went, why Why don't I follow my dream? It's a complete a reset, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So she did that. And I think that's how, as a family, we do cope with yeah. things. We go, okay, pressure's on. Do something about it. Yeah. And it might not work. And that's yeah. okay if it doesn't quite work. But you've probably come further than you realise when you look back. Yeah. And actually flipping that to us both being parents, bringing up children in the, in the digital age, you know, oh, yeah. social media and all that can go with that, with anxiety and who knows, inflation, inflammation and so on. How are you juggling being a working mum with the charity work, the, the, the actual logistics of traveling with, mm. with uh, the Formula One and being a present mum, wife, you know, how, how do you juggle that? Well, I think it has to be a team effort. Yeah. So you have to have sort of parity in terms of the the emphasis and onus you put on your career with your partner so they've got to buy into you as much as mm. you do um and then i think the involvement of your family in as much as you can yeah so we try to take the kids to pretty much everything that we go to whether it's glastonbury or 
Um, they haven't been to Glastonbury yet. They're still pushing for it. I bet but... you're looking forward to taking them, aren't you? You're probably oh, pushing them back, but we'll a bit see, like we'll you've see. been there to know what it's yeah. all about. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but certainly Flagstock, we've introduced them to music yeah. and live music and festivals, but also to Grand Prix, um, to also take part in things with us yeah. um, as, as a family. But but also, look, I'm not pretending it's easy and I am knackered most of the time. <laughs> so I haven't got this like, you know... S- the sort of silver bullet solution, whatever you want to call it, I, um, I'm i still working it out. Yeah. But I'm enjoying the adventure whilst I do yeah, it. Yeah, I can tell. And actually, I remember flipping back to December, I, w- I had a table at the Autosport Awards and you presented that. And you tell me how many people were in that room and the importance of some of those people from Sir Jackie Stewart to, you know, you, you know, the who's who of motorsport and business. And you owned that that night, as far as I was concerned. It, it, was, it, was, it was just, and, and your style, in the same way you're talking to me now, as in front of those however many thousands of people, was natural and um, it was energetic and it was humorous. Are you more anxious, if at all, mm. before an event like that or before going on live TV? Well, I think the short answer is probably, I'm, I probably have 30 seconds of pure adrenaline before both, yeah. and I get this like rush. What, literally as you're coming out as with I'm the microphone. Out, and like, it's that yeah. first 30 seconds of talking, or even 10 seconds, when you just go, okay, talk, 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 and then, oh, okay, I'm into it, it's fine. But without that, I think I think that kind of adrenaline's really quite healthy. Yeah, whatever you I get do. it, it's almost setting you up. And I said that to the kids today, because they got swimming gala today, and my son was really stressed about it. I said, but you're really good at swimming, like you're really sporty. He said, yeah, but that's the problem. I'm, everybody thinks I'm gonna win. And what if I don't? And I said, well, it doesn't matter if you don't. You're going to feel adrenaline in that first moment. But harness that. And I promise you, as soon as you're into your stroke, you're going to start loving it. What great advice. We were were talking earlier about the the education curriculum being archaic. And, you know, when did you last use a Bunsen burner? And you know what I mean? The whole, and yet actually that advice, that's life advice. And actually, I I just literally said, you know, how do you make time to do that? But that advice from yourself, your husband, that uh, is life advice, yeah. you know, for yeah. something like the gala, let alone an exam, or whatever it, it might be, everything. or a presentation, which is all stuff we're going to be doing when 100%. we grow up. And I tell you what, one key thing that I learned about losing Caroline is that we are all human. Yeah. So like anyone looking at Caroline's life would say she had it all, you know, brilliantly successful, incredible live presenter. I don't think anyone realises just how good she was at presenting Coming from you as well. Honestly, she's the best. She, um, and lovely energy and would light up a room, but, you know, obviously huge vulnerability there as well. So in that moment, when I walk out of the Autosport Awards, or indeed anywhere, or Wilf going into a swimming gala, everyone around you has the same Mm. anxiety, ambition, nerves, energy, all yeah. the things that make us human. Yeah. And yes, so Jackie Stewart has got something that says a three-time world champion and a legend of the sport. Yeah. But he's still, you know, when you hear him talk about his battles with dyslexia yeah. and growing up at school thinking he was stupid, he went on to be a multiple world champion and a, and, and a champion of safety and yeah. a huge Changed ambassador for dimen- uh, dementia, dementia with, with his wife. With his yeah. wife. So yeah. look what he's achieved with it yeah. and yet underpinning it quite a vulnerable child yeah. you know so I think in any moment anyone should remember <laughs> we all yeah it's quite humbling well it's very humbling 100% we're all human yeah. we're all human and we all actually need each other yeah to succeed and pop each other up and yeah be I know there you for explained that really well um, I could talk to you for a long long time we're going to run out of time but I wanted to end with some quick questions on yes. Formula One okay Who's the greatest driver, in your opinion, of all time? Oh, wow. God, no one cares who I think's the greatest driver. I do. I just asked Stop you. Stop it. And you followed the sport, right? And you're, mean, in, and you're in there. And, and I'm, I'm going to ask it in two ways, actually. Yeah. Talent. It's like, yeah. So you're the team boss. So you can oh, put anyone in. Wow. And then, actually, who's your favourite driver? Because you've met them. You're in a privileged position where for years now you've met them. So there's two questions left. Playing for time by having a sip of water. <laughs> I trade. think it's very difficult to compare from different ages. I get that. But there's someone I that comes to the top. with looking at Senna, thinking he was just... So maybe that, that taps into the child in me that was just in awe of yeah. Senna. But then when you look at Lewis 
and see what he's achieved. For me, what separates a sporting great from an icon is how they use their platform. Yeah. And for me, what Lewis has done alongside casually just scooping up seven world titles <laughs> yeah. is he's changing the world and that sounds very grand yeah. but it's true no, and it feels like he's only just getting going if anything he's yeah. racing right now it's not a distraction it's what he does but he's like you can tell super focused but the moment he down tools he'll just go so full on and, with and making a difference incredible. to the world which is, and, you, and you'll have the resources the contact i mean he, he'll be formidable yeah he already is he already is i mean so it's lewis a moment or, in history lewis or Senna, if you can put but one on the I team i also want to throw in nicky lauder to that because for yeah. me he was such a great character in the paddock long after his racing career was over but then when you actually consider what he did to come back from those catastrophic yeah. injuries yeah. and race a car. Wow, the yeah. resilience so true. of that man. So yeah. Can I have all three, please? You need a three-man a three man that's team. Po- that's my podium. It's yeah. <laughs> a formidable team. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask to choose you between them. They're all, they're all absolute greats. Um, who do you enjoy talking to the most in the current crop? So you've got the season coming up. You're yeah. going to be, in a matter of days, talking to the guys again who's the person that you look forward to putting the microphone in front of and Do you know I, they've all got very different yeah. personalities but there is a sort of like common thread between them there's a camaraderie between them yeah. and I think actually we're we're sport for choice with the current crop of drivers nice yeah you know, the Landos George Alex they're all really good fun yeah Daniel Ricciardo is always brilliant to interview because he always puts a positive spin on yeah. whatever's happened he's one of life's great energizers yeah. um i love the honesty frankness of of max and lewis yeah. because whatever they've been through they'll be honest and straightforward yeah. with you keeps them authentic yeah and we need that yeah. because you know it's not all plain sailing i mean it looks like it with max last yeah, it year, does. but it does. you know you forget the talent mm. um that is required to keep delivering even though you've got an incredible car, yeah. you've still got to do everything right. As it's shown on the Singapore weekend, yeah. you drop one ball and suddenly someone else is winning the race. So um, we're really lucky. And again, I've managed to dodge actually singling it to one person, I know, I? <laughs> I know. And I had an inkling of who it might have been, but I think, and I actually, you know, Daniel Ricciardo is just, he just seems, he seems like he'd be exactly the same off camera as on camera. Yeah. And I know you know him well off camera. And so that, that, that speaks volumes to me. Yeah. A woman in Formula One it hasn't happened in context of you know an actual um, secure drive yeah. and someone that's come in and just kind of owned it. Can yeah. you see that happening? Absolutely. Cool. One hundred percent. And how? I, I put when? My house how? On how? It. how oh, I think but it how, will be within. I hope within my lifetime yeah. that there will be a female world champion in Formula One. Cool. I'm going to say it here. I mean, it'd be now. huge for the sport, right? It'd it's, be huge uh, for life. It would yeah. be huge for global sport, yeah. not just Formula One. It'd be huge for. The progress of women yeah. in every workplace and disprove the theory that they can't and shouldn't. You know, it's, there it's is archaic. nothing physical exactly. that precludes a woman from yeah. racing a Formula One car and winning a Formula One car. The, the, one of the issues has been power steering. So someone would say, "Well, there isn't power steering in in the um, more junior series, mm. and therefore physically it's tougher for a woman." Once they get to Formula One, there is power steering, and so there isn't that that barrier. Yeah. But um, I, I really believe that with the right sponsorship and the right track time, crucially, it's about pounding in those yeah. 10,000 hours. It's like the outliers theory, isn't it? You've just got to get that track time in. Yeah. And I believe once we shift the mindset, and I think F1 Academy will achieve that, Yeah. if we can show girls that it is accessible, that there is an opportunity. Formula One is a meritocracy. If you work hard and you believe you will prosper and blossom, mm within that framework and the same can be said for women in motorsport it will happen yeah well i heard it here from natalie thank you so much for talking to you i've enjoyed it very very much cheers Matt. thank you cheers Thanks.